All right, well, sorry for the delay. Thank you for joining us. I hope you have been enjoying the seminars thus so far. Um, tonight, we're going to be talking about Daniel 2. So far, we've talked about a little bit about Daniel 7, a little bit about uh, the secret rapture, a little bit about uh, Daniel 9. But now we're going to talk about Daniel 2. And Daniel 2 is important because it sort of sets the tone for all the other prophecies that come after it. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to go to Daniel chapter 2. Now, the story, I'm going to give you the context that it all begins with a dream. And the dream uh, happens to Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar either can't remember his dream or wants to see how wise his wise men are. And he makes a proclamation that they need to interpret his dream. Now, mind you, it wasn't uncommon for pagans in every single culture to interpret dreams. This is the stuff that priests and shamans do all the time. As a matter of fact, we have people who do it now, say that they can interpret dreams. But when it comes to being able to tell you what your dream is and then interpret it, that's next level. So this is what Nebuchadnezzar decrees to all the wise men. And knowing that they can't do it, he decides that he's going to put them all to death. What does he need them for anyways? Now, when Daniel hears about this, he comes and pleads to Nebuchadnezzar and says, Hey, look, uh, there is a God in heaven who can interpret this. Just give me some time. So he and his friends, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, or in their Chaldean name, uh, Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they decide to get together and they pray and they ask God to show them what the king dreamed and its interpretation. Now, this is around the year, probably uh, maybe around 600, 600 BC, maybe 599. So it's all the way back then. And so they pray and they receive guidance on this dream. And they tell Nebuchadnezzar that this dream uh, if you're in Daniel 2, this dream is to tell him what is going to happen in the last times. And so Nebuchadnezzar is now to be told about everything that is going to happen. And he is told that this is for, as in Daniel chapter 2, verse 28, but there is a God in heaven, this is Daniel speaking to Nebuchadnezzar, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the vision in your head or upon your bed are these. So he's letting Nebuchadnezzar know that this dream that he has isn't just for him in his time, but extends way into the future, into the latter days. So we begin here in Daniel chapter 2, verse 28. And, and, and we're moving to 29. And he says, As for you, O king, the thoughts came to your mind while on your bed about what would come to pass. After this... And he who reveals secrets has made known to you what will be. So this is the future. But as for me, this secret has not been revealed to me because I have more wisdom than anyone living, but for our sakes who make known the interpretation to the king and that you may know the thoughts in your heart. You, O king, were watching and, be, and behold a great image. This great image, whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and it was, in its form was awesome. This image was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, and its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on the feet of iron and clay, and broke them in the pieces. Then the iron and clay and bronze and silver, gold, were crushed together and became like the chaff from the summer threshing floor. And the wind carried them away, that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream. Now we will tell you the interpretation before the king. So he has this massive dream. And you can see here in the image, this is sort of the, a depiction of what it might have looked like. You have a head of gold, chest and arms of silver, thighs and abdomen of bronze, and le feet of iron, sorry, legs of iron and feet of iron and clay, all mixed together in a stone that comes and crushes them and turns into a mountain. And now Daniel's going to interpret him this dream. Now keep in mind, this dream isn't just for Nebuchadnezzar. This reaches all the way down to the end of time. And so now this is what he says here. He says, you, O king, are king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom and power, strength and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, where the beasts of the field and the birds of heaven, he has given them unto your hand and has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. 
You are this head of gold. So he starts off and lets him know that he is the first. This statue starts and ends with Babylon, his kingdom, Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. And then it goes to another kingdom, another kingdom, but we'll let Daniel explain it. But after you shall rise another kingdom inferior to yours, then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over the earth. And a fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters all things. And like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break into pieces and crush all others. Now, I'm just going to give you a preview to the future. Uh, Scott will be talking about, uh, Evangelist Ritzema will be talking about Daniel 7. And in Daniel 7, there will be four beasts. And one of the beasts is going to have teeth made of iron, which is going to be crushing everything. And what you find in prophecy is something called recapitulation and expansion. Or to say that you're given an image or a dream or, or a prophecy, and then that prophecy is repeated and then explained. That happens throughout prophecy all the time, particularly in the books of Daniel and Revelation. So this prophecy is the foundation, and it will be repeated in Daniel, and it will be expanded in Daniel, and also expanded in the book of Revelation. These things all have their fulfillments. And so he goes on, and he, and he says, Whereas you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong, partly fragile. As you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. So we get this idea that whatever happens at these feet, there's parts that are strong, there are parts that are weak, but they never can get joined together. That's what he's saying, or they can never get joined together. And if we think about it, this must be, these feet of, of ten toes must be nations if all these other kingdoms, and they might be different than nations as uh, empires as we've known them in the past. And he goes on, Inasmuch as you saw, he says, And in the days of these kings, that means the feet of iron and clay, and in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break into pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. This is the kingdom of Christ. This is the kingdom of Christ. Jesus said to, to, to those, to his disciples, he said, He who falls on the stone will be broken, and he who the stone falls upon will be ground in the dust. He was referring to this very dream right here. The stone hits the image and destroys it. This tells us that mankind will not last forever. All these kingdoms will eventually be destroyed. As it says in 2 Peter, seeing that all these things will be dissolved. What manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? So the idea is that the reign of wicked mankind will not last forever. Eventually, another kingdom, a kingdom that has not been founded by men, but has been founded by Christ himself, shall come and fill the world. And then he says this, Inasmuch as you saw that stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and it broke into pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come, past, what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. So, very powerful, very powerful dream. And we have to understand this, and we have to understand this, that this is about the successive kingdoms of the earth. Now, the title of today's talk is about Daniel 2 and World War II. And we're going to talk a little bit about World War II, but what we want to understand is what is being explained here and how in the world do we get to World War II before we get to that stone there? And I hope to do that. But before we do that, we're going to pray one more time. Let us bow our heads. Gracious and Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this opportunity. And I just pray again for the Holy Spirit as we go through sacred scripture and make a case for the validity and reliability of the Word of God. Thank you for this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, I want you to understand something, that right after this chapter, that, and you look again here, 
that Nebuchadnezzar was told that he was the head of gold, but after him another kingdom would take over. And then after that another kingdom would take over. And then after that another kingdom would take over. And then it would be split up into ten parts. It would be split up into ten parts. And then the stone would come and destroy it. Now, I want you to understand something. No leader who wants absolute power has enjoyed this prophecy. Not one. They have all sought to have world dominion over all the people of the earth, and it has never worked out since the day this prophecy was given, perhaps in 599 AD or 598, sorry, 599 BC or 598 BC. How do we know this? The very next chapter in Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar commands that a statue is built. And that statue has the dimensions of at least two out of the three sixes. Now, why is that? Many people go, well, 666 is the mankind number. It's very evil. What you need to understand is that in Babylonian numerology, six is a sacred number. So now think about it. The Babylonians were so dumb, they were so dumb that they thought you could divide everything by six. I mean, how ridiculous is that, right? I mean, there's only, what, 24 hours in a day? There's 60 seconds in a minute. Uh, there's... In the lunar calendar, there's 360 days in a year. There's 12 months. Oh, wait, those are all divided by six, aren't they? That's how intelligent they were. They could, they could organize the universe by six. And three sixes was a sacred number for them. So in this statue that he builds, that sacred number is represented. But here's the thing. Why do you think the statue is made of gold? It's made of gold because what? He was the head of gold in the other one. But what was he trying to say? My kingdom will never end. There will be no stone cut without the hands of men that will defy me. There will be no kingdom that will overthrow my kingdom. The head, the statue of gold represents Babylon now and Babylon forever. But did Babylon fall? Absolutely it did. Did you know that Babylon was considered an impenetrable city? It was almost a perfect square and it had walls that were so wide and so high that you could ride two chariots right alongside of it. We know this because we've dug it up over the years. The gates were, were bronze and impenetrable, and they ran, the city was built on either side of the river Euph Euphrates. So if you wanted to get in the city, you had to get in the river, which made an assault to the gates nearly impossible. And with that, they felt that they were absolutely secure. And yet Babylon was overthrown without an army destroying the walls. It was actually overthrown in one night. As a matter of fact, this artist here, John Martin, depicts this here. And this story is actually depicted in the Bible. In, in Daniel 5, in Daniel 5, we actually read about this story of Belshazzar's feast. And Belshazzar is decided that in his feast that he is going to enjoy and revel because they believe that there's no way their city could fall. They believe that their kingdom would be without end. And while he's having the feast, he decides that he would bring out the vessels of the Lord. And they're filling him with wine and having a good time. And suddenly a hand appears writing on the wall, warning, uh, telling him that he has been weighed in the scales and found wanting. And that very night, the Persians, who are the next kingdom, come underneath the gates, wipe them all out, and they're gone. Now, how did it happen? Well, guess what? We don't even need to guess. It's in Herodotus. Herodotus describes it in detail how the Persians had slowly and secretly diverted part of the river Euphrates, and they were lowering it and lowering it. But the people in the city were so happy, they were so proud, they were enjoying life that no one was paying attention that the river was getting lower and lower. And then one night it got very low, and Cyrus and his army marched under the gates while everyone was partying, and they conquered the city in one night. And that is written by the Greek historian Herodotus, but we see it in the Bible from another perspective, another reason why the Bible can be trusted. Now, some people argue, because Daniel has been so accurate, he's so accurate, they say there's no way, there's no way that someone would be able to know all this. Because consider this, if the head is Babylon, which is overthrown by the Persians, right? And Daniel lived to then, there's no way that Daniel lived to see the Greeks overthrow the Persians. There's no way. It's impossible. And yet, there's no way that Daniel was living when the Greeks were overthrown by the Romans, who would be the legs of iron. There's no way. And yet, his prophecy stands true. So scholars have argued, well, this had to be written later. This was just written much later. There's no way. Well, 
scholars went back and they looked at examples in the Dead Sea Scrolls and some of the oldest manuscripts of the Hebrew Bible. And what they found is that Daniel is written with both Hebrew and Royal Aramaic. And that Royal Aramaic dates all the way back to the 6th century when Daniel would have been writing the book. When I say 6th century BC, that would be the 500s. That's when Daniel was writing the book, which tells you that he actually didn't, he did not witness these things as much as he testified to what God has said. After we have the head of gold Babylon, we have the chest and arms of silver, which are Persia, uh, and, that, and Persia overthrew Babylon in 538 BC, which Daniel was there. And then in 331 BC, uh, Alexander the Great uh, defeats the Persians, Dar Darius III, in the Battle of Gargamela, and he conquers this is an old mosaic that was found, and he begins to conquer all of Persia. That's the fall of Persia right there. Again, Persia was a world empire, and it collapsed, and the Greeks took over. Now, this is a wonderful art, artistic depiction of Archimedes. And I want you to understand something here. Archimedes was a genius, and he lived in Syracuse. Now, we're not talking about Syracuse, New York. We're talking about Syracuse, Italy, right? Syracuse, Italy. Now, think about I want you to understand something. This tells you how far the, the Grecian kingdom had expanded. It was right there in Italy. There's something called Magna Grecia. Greece, at its maximum power, covered almost the entire Mediterranean. And so when the Romans start rising up in power, they come down to Sicily, which is almost connected to the Italian peninsula. They come down to Sicily to conquer, and this is where Archimedes is. Now, the story is, is that Archimedes is doing some mathematics, and the soldier was told to capture him, but Archimedes treated him so rudely and said, I'm not done, that he killed him anyways, which was a great loss for mankind. But here's the important thing to understand. Archimedes was killed in 212. The Roman... Uh, conquest of Greece was gradual and they assimilated most of it. So while there were wars that happened, it did, there wasn't just one war that wiped them all out. They assimilated much of Greece, Greek culture and they slowly began to conquer both through war, trade, diplomacy until the entire Greek empire was now in the hands of the Romans. Which we see again a temple here that was abandoned in 250 BC and classic Classical ancient Greece ends roughly at 146 BC. So walk, we're going to walk through this. We have Babylon, the head of gold. Daniel's writing that that dream probably happened in 599. Uh, Daniel was captured in 605 BC, probably 599, 590. The head of gold. Head of gold runs all the way to 538, 539, depending on the scholar. 538, 539 BC when Cyrus, who represents the Persians, conquers the Babylonians. And that kingdom runs from, uh, from 538, 539, all the way down to 331 BC when, when Alexander the Great defeats the Persians. And the Greeks last from that time period, there was a time where Alexander was alive, he lived to 323 BC, and, he was, and after he died, his kingdom was divided into four parts, which will be very important later on, in the book of Daniel. His kingdom was divided in four parts amongst his four generals, Lysimachus, Cassander, Ptolemy, and Seleucid. And after that, Rome was rising up and Rome conquers Greece in 146 BC. Notice that Daniel might have lived, might have lived to about 515. Remember, BC goes in reverse. Might have lived to 515, even 500. But there's no way he could have predicted Greece or Rome. It's impossible. Absolutely impossible, which tells you that in order for this dream to be accurate and valid, it had to be given by divine inspiration. There's no other way. There's no other way, which is why we can trust prophecy. And now we have the Roman Republic. The Roman Republic begins around 509 BC. Like I told you, it was concomitant with Greece, and it, it terminates its rise, and it goes from the Republic to the Empire in 27 BC, and from 27 BC, it meets its end in four something. Does anyone know when it ends? It's okay if you don't. It's, it's all right. We'll get there. But, Greek, but the Roman Empire ends. Now, I, this picture right here, I want you to see this. This is important. This is a picture of a woman by the name of Perpetua. Have you ever heard of Perpetua? Perpetua was a young Christian woman of a patrician family. And she became a Christian. And in those days, 
it, the, they did not like anyone becoming Christians, particularly if you were a patrician family. That means you had old, old money in their eyes. And you were from a very wealthy class of people. And for you to become a Christian was an outrage, even though there was a lot of outrageous things that Romans did. And they said to her, said, look, if you, if you decide that you want to remain as a Christian, you're going to die and your family is going to lose their inheritance. They're going to lose it all because you were a Christian. All you have to do, you don't have to believe in our gods. You don't even have to say prayers. You don't have to do anything. All you have to do is take about incense about this much, and you just drop it into a little altar, and we'll say, let bygones be bygones. You can go worship your God, do whatever you want, and that's it. That's all she had to do. A little bit of incense in the altar. And what did she say? No, thank you. Here's my neck. Take my head. I'm not going to do it. And she would rather serve Christ than pinch incense publicly to an altar. This is where the Roman Empire begins to persecute the Christians in these times. And this is fascinating because this persecution would go on for a time until about 313 uh, AD. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. The reason why I point this out is even though Rome was persecuting Christians, Christians reading Daniel 2, Daniel 2, like we just talked about, because what do we know about, what do we know so far? Every single kingdom, whether it be the head, the chest, the thighs, the legs, and the feet, it all comes to an end, right? It all comes to an end. And so reading Daniel 2, this is, this is Tertullian, full name Quintus Septimius Florens Tertullianus. Don't worry, there's not going to be a question on the test on that one. <laughs> Tertullian, reading Daniel and seeing that the Roman Empire is going into its autumn years, that's falling apart. This is what he says, reading prophecy. So he's looking at Daniel 2. He's looking at the Antichrist powers in Daniel 7. He's looking at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And this is his conclusion. So the, I'm not going to read everything else. I'm just going to read the italics and the bold. And so he's talking about 2 Thessalonians 2. He's talking about Daniel 2. He's talking about Daniel 7. And his analysis is this. And this is what he says. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now hinders must hinder until he is taken out of the way. What is he talking about? He's talking about 2 Thessalonians. He's talking about the rise of the Antichrist. Okay, So he's worried about the rise of the Antichrist. And he's thinking about Daniel 2, Daniel 7, 2 Thessalonians. That's what he's thinking about. And what does he say? What obstacle is there but the Roman state, the falling away of which by being scattered into ten kingdoms? Now wait, where does Tertullian get the idea that Rome, the legs of iron, will be destroyed and scattered into ten kingdoms? Where is he getting that from? He's Daniel 2. He read Daniel 2 and he says he's predicting in 240. Let's just say this is the day, this is on his deathbed in 240. It's actually probably one, one, 198 or something like that, maybe even 200. So 200. Now remember, Rome doesn't fall until the 400s, and I'll give you the day. Rome doesn't fall to the 400s, and Tertullian is predicting in his day that Rome's going to fall, and the Antichrist is going to be revealed, and when Rome falls, it will be divided in 10 parts. How does he know this? Because he just read prophecy. So he says this, What obstacle is there but the Roman state, the falling away of which by being scattered into ten kingdoms, shall inter introduce the Antichrist upon its own ruins. Think about that. He was predicting that based on what we read in Daniel 2. Here he is again, making another comment about the Antichrist coming, and notice what he says. Notice what he says. Again, he's writing maybe 200. The Roman Empire falls in 400, and I'll give you the exact date, falls around that time. So over 200 years before Rome falls, Listen to what he says. Two Christians who have been persecuted by Rome. This is what he says. There's also another great necessity of our offering prayer in behalf of the emperors. Nay, for the complete stability of the empire and the Roman interest in general. For we know that a mighty shock impending the whole earth, in fact, the very end of all things, is threatening dreadful woes, is only retarded by the continued existence of the Roman Empire. We have no desire then to be overtaken by these dire events, and in praying that their coming may be delayed, we are lending our aid to Rome's duration. So notice, he's predicting Rome's going to fall, be put into ten parts, and the Antichrist is going to be revealed at that time. And he's saying we need to pray that this persecuting power lasts longer 
for the stability so we have time to reach people for Jesus. Think about that. That's his prediction. And he dies well before Rome falls, but that's what he was saying. Here's Hippolytus, who, 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 was, who was a bishop, and this is what he says, and he dies in 235. Now listen, he's looking at Daniel 2 again. Both he and Tertullian are looking at Daniel 2, and they're predicting the end of the Roman Empire. This is what Hippolytus says. The legs of iron and the beast, dreadful and terrible, expressed, it, it, terrible, expressed the Romans who hold sovereignty at present, and the toes and feet which are part clay and part iron, and the ten horns were emblems of the kingdom that are yet to rise. So notice, he's living in Rome, and he says the ten toes of that statue of Daniel and the ten horns that you read uh, later on in Daniel 7 and in and Revelation 13 and Revelation 12, there's a repeat there, as I said, recapitulation expansion. He says that that is going to happen. In other words, he knows that Rome is going to fall based on Bible prophecy. And he's saying this 200 years before it even happens. How does he know? He's not that smart. But God is. God knows. He goes on. Our yet to rise and the other little horn that grows up among them meant the Antichrist in their midst. The stone that smites the earth and brings judgment upon the world was Christ. So he knows that what's next in the prophetic timeline is that Rome's going to fall, it's going to be divided into ten, and the Antichrist power is going to be revealed. That's what he is saying. Again, how does he know? Well, here's the interesting thing. Rome does fall, the western part does fall, in 476 A.D. And interestingly, the last emperor of Rome was an 11-year-old boy named Caesar Romulus Augustus. Do you remember one of the great emperors of Rome? His name was what? Augustus Caesar. So the last emperor has the same name almost as the first emperor. He, he, is, he is deposed in 11, and Odasser the general of the Herili army, which is part of those ten tribes that take over, gets his power and he becomes basically the leader of Rome and the fall of Rome is complete. These ten, ten tribes go in and begin to conquer. This is an actual coin from Odasser and this was minted in 477 AD. When did he take over Rome? In 476, he was able to mint the coin right after that which celebrates the fall of of Rome. So think about that. Tertullian and Hippolytus were predicting over 200 years in advance that Rome would fall and be divided into ten based in part on the prophecies of Daniel 2. How did they know? There's no way they could have known except that they took the Word of God seriously. So when we're talking about the statue, we're talking so far when we start with the head, we're dealing with one piece, right? And when we go to the chest and arms, which are put together like this, we're dealing with one piece. And then when we go to the thighs and abdomen, we're dealing with bronze, which is still one piece. But then we get to the legs, and there are two pieces. Question, was Rome divided into two parts? Yes, it was. Remember, when Constantine took over, what did he do? He removed the capital of Rome to what? Constantinople, which is known as Istanbul to this very day. Well, did Istanbul... Or, well, I already answered the question. Did Constantinople fall? Yes, that's why it's called Istanbul. When did it fall? This is a wonderful picture by Fausto Zanaro about Mohammed II. And he approached with these, with these new inventions called canon, which worked so well. And there he is in 1453, celebrating his victory, entering Constantinople to crush the rest of the Roman Empire, 1453. Interestingly, all that is actually foretold in the book of Revelation, but it was foretold before in the book of Daniel. So, back to my point. Every single king and kingdom has resisted this vision. Nebuchadnezzar, when he first heard it, said, no, 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 my kingdom is going to last forever. There will be no chest and arms of silver. There will be no thighs an abdomen of bronze, there will be no legs of iron, and there will be no feet of iron and miry clay, and there certainly won't be no stone that's going to crush it all. It is going to be gold. It'll be Babylon today and forever. And he resisted, but guess what? He was wrong, right? All those things came to pass, despite how mighty of men these all were. And just like Rome fell, and you can see the ten tribes moving in there and conquering Rome, that all happened. 
And we see again another, another map of the ten tribes. You have the Ostrogoths, the Vistagoths, the Vandals, the Suevi, the Franks, the Angles and Saxons, and Alemanni and Lombards, right? Those are all ten tribes. Interestingly, you'll read later on, uh, Evangelist Ritzema will go over it, that there are three of the ten that are uprooted. And one of them is, and we saw him, he was the Herili leader, Oraser, his, his line was uprooted, and the Vandals were uprooted, and the Ostrogoths were uprooted. Again, prophecy being fulfilled. But nonetheless, as soon as Rome fell, and as I told you, as soon as Rome fell, you have strong men who have resisted God's prophecy. They've resisted it. And one of the men, the first man to resist it at the time of the Romans was the Emperor Justinian. Justinian is known for a lot of things, including his law, the Codex Justiniana, which laid the foundation for uh, medieval law. Uh, he wanted to unite the Roman Empire, and if you look carefully, his foot, his foot is on top of another man's foot, and that man whose his foot is on top of is his uh, courageous general, Belisarius. And he sends Belisarius to reconquer the Roman Empire, get rid of all those tribes and reconquer it. And Belisarius makes a valiant attempt, gets most of the land back to recreate the Roman Empire. That's what they were going to do. He makes a valiant attempt to recreate the Roman Empire, but does it last? No. As soon as, as, soon as Belisarius and Justinian die, it falls apart. They tried. They used all their might, all the military prowess, and for a time it looked like they were successful. You know what they were able to do in that time? They were able to overthrow the Ostrogoths. They were able to throw the Herili and the Vandals, just as Bible prophecy would have told us. Another man that came later on to create, recreate the Roman Empire, this is the Holy Roman Empire, is Charlemagne. And Charlemagne tried to unite the powers of Europe, tried to make it cohesive, tried to give him one religion in Catholicism, tried to do all this, but he too failed. And here he is uniting church and state to create the Holy Roman Empire. His, his uh, successor, Charles V, who has all the money of all the gold of the Mesoamericas and South America, in his treasury also attempted to unite all of Europe under one faith, under one ruler, and he was unsuccessful. And then another man came, and his name is Napoleon. And Napoleon thought, I'm going to unite Europe, but I'm not going to do it necessarily under God. I'm going to do it under uh, reason. And, and worldly wisdom, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to overthrow the medieval law of Justinian, and we're going to establish a new law. And so he tries to unite, and he makes considerable success, which you can see in the picture. The only places against him are essentially in orange. And he gets very close, and you can see the, his trappings here. He looks like a Caesar from Rome, not a French emperor. And yet... The, the imagery is purposeful because he's trying to recreate what God said would not cleave together. Remember what happened. After Rome falls, it's divided into ten. And in that ten are pieces of iron and pieces of clay. And what were we told in the Bible? The two shall not hold together. And yet these strong men are trying to create this kingdom, and it doesn't ever happen. You can see here in the middle... Consi uh, like, just like Rome, he has the eagle. This is Napoleon's own uh, coat of arms. Well, after Napoleon, guess what? The monarchs of Europe decided that they could unite all of Europe, despite what God has said, that the two shall not be uh, should not hold together. They decided that they would be able to do it through marriage. So you can look through the different lines here, and they worked very hard to intermarry so they would all be related and not have wars and be a united Europe, thus negating what Daniel was told, what Daniel told King Nebuchadnezzar so long ago. And you can look here, you can see King George V, Tsar Nicholas II, and Kaiser Wilhelm II. All two of these men lost their thrones after World War I. So World War I happened, and the, two of these men lost their thrones. It didn't work even through marriage. And yet now we get down to this. And this is an article that was published July 2nd, 1940. And this was written by uh, Arthur uh, Maxwell, who was the editor, and he was living in Britain at this time. And that's because another man was trying to create a thousand-year Reich. He wanted to unite all of Europe 
and he wanted to rule, have this rule of a thousand years. And of course, you would recognize that man as Hitler. That's what he wanted to do. And of course, notice the symbol here. We see the eagle, like the Romans had, and we see the swastika, and we go, well, that's, that's just German, right? Well, no, it's not. We see the eagle here. Here are swastikas on a Roman mosaic. So the swastika and the eagle are all Roman. And here he is trying to align, again, bring those ten toes, the feet of iron and miry clay together, and they're not sticking, even though for a time it looked like he would be successful. And so this is what Arthur Maxwell says in July 2nd, 1940. He says, more than 60 years ago, in the earliest issues of the Signs of the Times, there appeared the following fearless statement concerning the overthrow of the ancient Roman Empire and the future of Europe. Crushed beneath the weight of its own vast proportions, it crumbled to pieces, never to be united again. Its elements lost power of cohesion, and no man nor combination of men can again consolidate them. In the long, dark, turbulent years that have elapsed since then, this journal has never once gone back on this interpretation of the great prophecy of the second chapter of Daniel. It does not propose to go back on it now, however unpropitious the present circumstances may seem. So what is he talking about? He's talking about World War II. At this time, Hitler is winning all these battles, and he is now predicting in the face, uh, and he's, listen, he's living, in Europe, he's living in England, and in England, they're preparing for bombing at night. They're preparing. They have sirens. People have to go to shelters and sleep in shelters. They're preparing to be invaded. Uh, in, 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 unlike the United States, the United States has a Second Amendment. And so it is the right of Americans to keep and bear arms. In England, that did not exist. And yet, in England, because they were so worried about Hitler overthrowing them, that they, uh, they issued military rifles to anyone who wanted them because they were afraid that the Germans could invade any time. That's how worried they were. So this is what he says. True, many are beginning to ask question and entertain doubts. Our interpretation is under fire. People are saying to us, look what's happening in Europe today. This new Napoleon is so strong that no one can stop him. He is bound to spread his dominion over the whole continent. What are you going to say now? We are going to say exactly what we have said in the past. We refuse to retract one jot or one tittle. We believe that the prophecy in question is not only the most remarkable and most significant to be found in all the scriptures, but that it is absolutely authentic and reliable. Furthermore, we believe that its interpretation will never be overthrown by any sequence of events that may occur. This prophecy is the only one in the Bible which, to, to which the two words certain and sure are both attached, if for no other reason, with these two. With these two seals upon it, we surely trust with complete confidence it cannot fail to refresh our mind, to, cannot fail to refresh our minds and reestablish our faith. Let us examine it in, again in detail. To do so, we must go back 25 centuries into the court of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. So they go back, he reviews it in this. But notice what he said. He goes, it doesn't matter what this guy Hitler's saying. It doesn't matter what he's doing. He will not succeed. Why does he say that with such confidence? Even though all of Europe was quaking, it's because he had been looking at the prophecy through the years. Babylon fell, Persia fell, Greece fell, Rome was divided into two and fell into ten parts. And we are told that though out of those ten parts, those ten toes, the iron and clay mixed together will not be cohesive. There will always be division. And why does he say this in July 2nd, 1940? Well, just a month before, on June 1st, 1940, was one of the worst defeats for the Allies, and that was the evacuation of Dunkirk. And here are newspaper articles talking about this. They had to evacuate over 100,000 British soldiers. If the British don't get those men out of Dunkirk, if they don't get them out of France, it is absolutely certain that Germany would have conquered Britain. Absolutely certain. That was all they had. And what was said is that the, the British uh, military generals thought for a moment that they could leave those guys in France to die or be captured. They actually thought that. They were like, well, it's too hard. We can't get them out of there fast enough. We don't have enough boats. They literally did not have enough boats to get those men out. And they thought about leaving them there because there's nothing they could do. So they actually went. They got on the radio and they asked anyone who had a boat 
that was large enough to pick up men to sail across the English Channel to pick up these soldiers to stop them from being captured and killed. And they had to, they, got, they were fortunately successful to get over 100,000. Sadly, some of those crossing the English Channel died by running into a mine. The Germans had so much superiority that their, uh, their planes were able to strafe down on men trying to get loaded into boats. I mean, it was absolutely awful. It looked like they would absolutely fail. And yet, Arthur Maxwell, after seeing all this, the, 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 the harrowing escape of the, of, of the British soldiers from France, seeing that England is now on its heels, that France has capitulated, which had one of the largest armies in Europe, that Spain has capitulated, the Netherlands capitulated, that Belgium capitulated, Austria was on their side, and that, that there was a treaty between Russia and Germany that it looked like all Europe was wrapped up. And yet, Maxwell stands there and says, I'm sorry. The Bible says that the dream is certain and the prophecy is sure. And he decides to boldly state that Hitler will fall to based on Daniel 2. And this is what he says here. He says, or imagine yourself living in one of those war-cured years from 1800 to 1812, or even till 1815, when the name Napoleon struck terror in the heart of every inhabitant of Europe. Imagine news reaching you that, that nation after nation had been invaded and the conqueror's relatives had been placed on every vacated throne. Ask yourself what you would have thought then about the fulfillment of Daniel 2. Yes, indeed, for eight years or more, in those days, the prophecy might have well have seemed in jeopardy, yet it was not. After the storm had passed and the weapons of war had been laid down, the word of God was seen to be more firmly established than ever. So it will be in our day, and we shall not have to wait long now, not in these swiftly moving times. Can we not encourage our hearts from these dear lessons of the past? Dark is the present hour. Shall we not believe and trust and watch God working his purpose out? Heaven and earth shall pass away, he says to us, but my words shall not pass away. Mark 13, 31. Tyrants and invaders, the would-be conquerors cannot succeed. Not for long anyways. And it matters not whether they be German or Italian or French or Spanish. Their plans to dominate Europe are doomed to failure from, out, from the outset. They may achieve temporary triumphs. They may overrun Holland and Belgium and France and every Balkan state. They may pour death and destruction on Britain. Yet along the very trail of their wanton cruelty and ruthless barbarism, there will grow up and accumulate the very forces that will ultimately destroy them. Defying them to their very worst, the words of the ancient prophecy flash in letters of fire across the dark, lowering storm clouds of these turbulent times. They shall not cleave one to another. They shall not cleave. One power will not rule the world, not until Christ himself comes to reign, which is indeed the next greatest event on the calendar of human history. The divisions of the old Roman Empire will remain until the very end, for it is in, these, in the days of these kings that the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, a kingdom that shall not be left to other people, but it shall break into pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. So cast not away, therefore, your confidence. The dream is certain, and the interpretation is sure. Now, I just have to say this. Have there been attempts since this to unite all of Europe? Yes, there's a European Union. Uh, the, there's a World Economic Forum. There's all these things that are trying to unite the world powers. And for a time, it will look like they are successful. It will look like their plans are going to succeed. But if we have the confidence that Arthur Maxwell had, and we have the confidence that the early Christians had, that we can put our trust in the prophecy of Daniel 2. But Honestly, sometimes it seems academic. Everything that I said, oh, you, you talked about Babylon falling in 530 and 538. You talked about Persia falling in, in 331. You talked about Greece falling in 146. You talked about Rome falling in 460, 460, 476 B.C. and 1453 A.D. And then you talked about the powers of Europe. That's just academic. It's just academic. The, 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 the feet of iron, that's all academic. What does it mean personally? What does this mean personally to me? How can Daniel 2 make any difference in my life whatsoever? That's a good question to ask, right? 
But I want you to see the difference that Daniel II made in the life of a man who was a Seventh-day Adventist. So Seventh-day Adventists have a history. And if you, any of you saw the movie, Hacksaw Ridge, it was about Desmond Doss, who was a conscientious objector. And he was a Seventh-day Adventist, and he believed that you should not pick up arms and fight, though he wanted to serve in the United States. He did that, and he was able to be, he was a Congressional Medal of Honor winner as a non-combatant medic, which is incredible. And his story is incredible. But what if you were drafted on the wrong side of that war? What if you were a believing Christian Seventh-day Adventist who doesn't want to fight, and you were drafted to fight for the Nazis? And you didn't want to fight for the Nazis. Well, they didn't have conscientious objection. If you were a conscientious objector, they put you on your knees, they put a gun to the back of your head, and they pulled the trigger, and then your family was dispersed, your wife was then made the plaything of other soldiers, and your kids, who knows where they went. That was his other option. And he said, I guess I'm going to have to join. And he prayed that God would put him in a position where he would not use a gun because he felt that Hitler was wrong. To make matters worse, at that time in Germany, they were looking for people. They were looking for people who happen to be Jews who keep the Sabbath. The Sabbath is the seventh day. The Jews have always kept Saturday. Well, Franz Hazel was a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, which meant that he too kept Saturday. And worse than that, many Jews eat cult uh, kosher which means that the law in Leviticus 11, which says certain things are clean and certain things are unclean, Franz Hazel also, hate, also ate that way too. So here's a man who doesn't want to fight for Hitler, who for all intents and purposes to uneducated people, looks like he's a Jew. That's what they would say, he's a Jew. He goes, no, I'm a Christian, I believe in Christ. They go, no, 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 you don't want to work on Friday and you want to have Saturday off, that's what a Jew would do. He goes, no, I'm a Christian. Oh, no, you're, you don't eat pork? You don't eat shellfish? You're a Jew. You're a Jew. So here he is in a precarious situation. Precarious situation. So he says, God, please help me. This is the book, A Thousand Shall Fall. It's an excellent book. I've read it with my daughter. Excellent. He prays, and what happens is God puts him in the engineering division of the Wehrmacht, which is the war, is the, essentially the army of World War II. He puts him in the, in the pioneer division, which was the engineers, so he'd be building bridges and roads, but he was required to carry a gun. He was required to carry a gun. If you didn't carry a gun as a German officer, because he was, he was intelligent, he could read, he was made an officer, if you didn't carry a gun, you would be shot. They, this idea of disobeying orders, conscientious objection, that's for the Americans. In Germany, under Nazi Germany, there was no, I don't want to carry a gun. Everyone carries a gun. But he realized he, he was under such conviction that he didn't want to shoot anyone because he felt like if bullets were coming at him, the natural reaction would be to shoot back. So what he did, and this was illegal, he could have been killed for this, he actually took his gun and he threw it into a pond. And then he had a carpenter in a local shop make him a wooden cutout. And then he made it black with shoe polish and kept it in his holster so no one would know he wasn't even carrying a gun. That's how dedicated he was. But here's the thing. Here he is, and now he's drafted in the army. He's asking God to help him. And he sees that the, many of the things that his leaders are doing are absolutely immoral, and he can't take it. But what does he believe in all this? He knows that Hitler will fail. Hitler will fail. And as a matter of fact, why does he know that? Because he believes in Daniel too. He believes just as we've broken down the statue, just as Arthur Maxwell said, he believes that that's true. But here's the thing. To tell anyone in the German army that the Fuhrer is going to fail and there will be no thousand years of, of the Third Reich, there will be no thousand years, is not only heresy, but it's an offense that you can be shot and killed for. They don't mess around in Germany in those days. There was no negotiation. And so here he is. He believes it. And so he is dispatched, and you can see in the map here, he's dispatched. If you look on the south line, you look on the south line there, where he leaves Poland and he goes through Ukraine into Russia, and he's dispatched to go all the way to Stalingrad, okay? That's where he's heading. And as he's going there, they're building bridges and roads, and they're often attacked. While they're building a bridge, the other side will be shooting at them, and they would have to hide. They were in sometimes the very thick of battle, even though they weren't often shooting back. And so anyways, he's going through there, and 
the soldiers are trying to keep morale. They're like, Heil Hitler, we're going to, we're going to win. This is, we're going to destroy Russia. And for a time, it looks like they're going to succeed. When they go into Ukraine, all of Ukraine is so excited because they've overthrown communism that they welcome the Nazis, out of all people. They welcome them as heroes. And they come out and bring the party, so it looks like they're going to succeed. And as they're marching towards Russia, the Russians are fleeing. They don't even have the strength to fight, but they start to get to Stalingrad. And so the morale for the German soldiers is high. But Franz knows what prophecy says. So one night, they're all hanging out, and there's, the men are playing cards. Franz did not play cards. He didn't believe in it. He did not drink alcohol. Like I said, he even kept the Sabbath, which people accused him of being a Jew, and he wasn't. I mean, he, he, his, his life was held in this type of balance throughout the entire war. And so he's there, and, and there, the men are drinking, and Franz is tired, and so he gets a little loose with his tongue. And they're all talking about the thousand-year Reich, how the Fuhrer is going to win, and Franz goes, we're not going to win, guys. We're not going to win. We're going to lose. It's not going to happen. They're like, like, you know, like you go to a party, the music's playing, the record scratches. I mean, that's what happened there. The music stops, and everyone's like, what did you just say? You realize you can be shot for that. You can be shot for that. And he's like, no, I'm just telling you. I'm not drinking. I'm telling you right now, we're not going to win. It's going to end up in failure. And they're like, and his commanding officer is there. And he trusts Franz, and he likes him. And he, he dismisses the party and tells everyone to go to bed. Because he knows if Franz keeps talking, someone's going to drag him out and shoot him for, for essentially uh, undermining morale of the military. A couple days later, the commanding officer, Captain uh, Micus is his name, he calls Franz in. And he says, we want you to come in. He brings in three other commanding officers. He says, I want you to, I, I, you know, you've done a good job here, but we want to talk about some things. Why do you think we're not going to win? This is, we're speaking openly. You're not going to be court-martialed or anything, but I want to hear it. Because Franz has shown his character so well throughout all the years that he served that they respect him. So they're giving him a chance. And what does he do? He picks up his Bible, and he starts with Daniel 2, and he explains the head of gold, the chest and, and, and uh, arms of uh, silver, the thighs and abdomen of brass, or, or bronze and the legs of iron and the feet of iron and clay and the stone that comes out. And he explains it all to him. Tells him some of the very history that I'm telling you. And his commanding officer says, okay, you're dismissed. And Franz is thinking, all right, well, I'm going to try to write a letter to my wife and my children back home. He had a wife and kids. I'm going to write a letter and probably say goodbye to them. They're probably going to dig a hole for me, not too far away, put a bullet in my head and just cover it up and say that I died in battle. That's probably what they're going to do. Because I just told them that Bible says that they're not going to win. And worst of all, I keep the Sabbath, I don't eat pork, and, and I'm using the Old Testament to show them that. So they're going to probably accuse me of being a Jew and shoot me. His commander comes to him in his room, comes to attention, says, don't worry about that. He says, he says you didn't know this, but before the war I was a historian. I taught at the university. Everything you said I know is to be true. Everything you said about the statue I know to be true. I don't believe what you believe, but I trust what you said. Let me borrow your Bible. So Franz is like, okay. Gives him his Bible. Comes back the next day. He goes, I've read it. It is what you said. This is what I want you to do. We're, we're marching into Russia. In order for us to make it, in order for us to make it, I want you to take one-third of our fuel reserves and save it. I want you to take a third of our trucks and keep them in the back because when we have to run, we're going to need those fuel and that truck and those trucks. We're going to need it. So he says, but you can't tell anyone about it because if we're shown to be saving fuel, if we're shown to be saving trucks, it means that we know we're going to lose. So you can't tell anyone. He's like, yes, sir. I'll take care of it. So as they're marching, Franz is meticulously saving oil, saving gas, saving trucks, making sure there are some working trucks left, not keeping them all up the line. Sure enough, as they're, in the, as they're in the Battle of Stalingrad and things reverse and they get defeated, they get the note, retreat. We're in a full out retreat. Many of the Germans who tried to get out there, they, their tanks were gone, their, their trucks were gone, they were all blown up and all they could do was try to run for it. But Franz and his men 
because of Daniel 2. They were able to get in those trucks with fuel and start driving. And then they got to, I believe, Austria. They got to Austria. And they actually beat people who left before them because they still had working trucks. They still had fuel. They get to Austria and they're told this. But if you, if you get to Berlin by a certain time, you can surrender to the Americans. If you don't get to Berlin by a certain time, you will have to be captured by the Russians, which means you will be killed immediately or put into a gulag where you will die after working yourself to death. So they had to make like mad to get from Austria all the way to Berlin because he believed in what Daniel 2 had said. They had enough fuel to make it. They were able to drive like madmen to get all the way there, and they got there right as the deadline expired. When he walked in and the Americans were saying, you know, the men were coming there to surrender, the men were taking off their belts you know, and throwing their guns into a pile, and they were surrendering. That was the very day after that. You were going to be a prisoner in Russia, and you would never be seen again. You were going to be dead. They, he got there because they had enough fuel. And what was funny is when he took off his belt and he threw his gun on the pile, his three other friends who were in the army with him looked at it and looked at the, the piece of wood, and they go, friends, what is that in there? Like, what is that? And he's like, well, I have a story to tell you. But nonetheless, because of Daniel 2, this man was responsible for not only saving his life, but the life of many of his friends because he told them the truth. So when you think about this, there's always room for truth in your life. There's always going to be something about Bible truth that will give you a chance to ultimately survive and that's why Daniel 2 is so powerful and so important. Thank you.